I want to give you all a big welcome to this afternoon's webinar. And we're really lucky that today we're joined um, by GSMA and also a lot of others who've contributed to recent research and information that's happened in Burundi. So I'll introduce you officially to those um, the panelists just in one moment. But for those of you who've never met me before, my name is Sarah Corley. I'm Deputy Director at DFI, and I'm pleased to be hosting DFI's webinar series and happy to be with uh, many of you again for today's webinar. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we start. We are recording today's session. So if you do have problems with internet connectivity, don't worry, you'll get a full um, recording sent to you that you can catch up. But more importantly, if you do really enjoy today's session, then we really ask you to share that recording with other like-minded colleagues so more people can hear what we discuss at our webinars. You um, will be going through sort of an hour today and towards the end of the hour, we're gonna have uh, time for your questions. So please, I ask you to put your questions in the Q&A function, which you'll find towards the bottom of the screen. And then that way we can manage the questions and ask them a lot easier than if you um, put them in the chat. So please use that, do use that Q&A function. So we're delighted to uh, welcome back GSMA. We've had both Jenny and Zoe um, on previous webinars with us, um, and we really value their input because the GSMA do a lot of work and fantastic research and write great reports um, and work, do a lot of work in the humanitarian space. So it was lovely that when I uh, got a message from Jenny well, asking to come back on the series because more work had been done in the country of Burundi and particularly around the concept of human-centered design, which is something that's so important, but actually something that's also quite difficult to understand how to do well and what the outcomes can be if done well for the, for the recipients. So I'm really, really glad that we've got an hour to learn more about the experiences in Burundi. We've got the experts also with us on the call that were involved in the work, and um, Louisa, Theo, and Wood. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing, um, hearing and learning more. So without further ado, Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And welcome everyone to this webinar. It's great to see so many of you joining us. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Jenny Caswell and I'm the Director for Research and Insights at GSMA's Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation Programme. And I'm really delighted to be joined um, by such a fantastic panel who are representing both the mobile industry and the humanitarian perspectives on cash and voucher assistance programming. Before I officially introduce uh, our wonderful panel, um, and we get into the discussion, I wanted to share a bit of context on why we're exploring this specific topic on human-centered design in cash programming today. So at the GSMA, we've been exploring mobile money-enabled cash and voucher assistance for the past five years or so now. And in our program, Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation, which is funded by the UK aid um, FCDO, we are seeking to accelerate the impact and delivery of digital humanitarian assistance. And this topic of mobile financial services has been one of our five core themes since the launch of our M4H programme. And we've been working with our mobile operator members on the one side and our humanitarian partners on the other to catalyse partnerships and to try and unblock some of the operational challenges of leveraging mobile money for CVA delivery in contexts where it can make sense. We know as well that there's huge potential that can come from delivering cash assistance digitally through mobile money if the time's taken to create a well-functioning digital ecosystem and to optimise digital and financial inclusion opportunities. But we also know that the operating environments for mobile money to function as a delivery mechanism, but also as a useful financial service or tool for affected populations is almost always harder in humanitarian settings. And this is for a number of reasons that I'm sure many of you on the call today will know well, both on the supply side and, and on the demand or, demand or user side. Um, and we're going to hear a lot more about these challenges and potential ways to address them during the panel discussion today. But despite these numerous challenges, through our work um, at the GSMA, we've seen that when strong partnerships are created between mobile operators and humanitarian organisations, there can be huge benefits for humanitarian organisations in terms of things like increased transparency, fast and flexible delivery, or even a reduced risk to humanitarian staff who no longer have to actually physically deliver cash in envelopes. We also see benefits to mobile operators. 
And this can include things like onboarding of new customers, increased brand recognition, and even return on investment. Although this is often a challenging business case. But what we've seen time and again is that the transformational impact of digitizing CVA for the recipients of cash is often overlooked or an afterthought. And although the evidence is clear on the benefits of cash itself for end users, there still remains this dearth of evidence on the experience for end users of digitizing that process. So it's exactly that component that we've tried to explore through this project with Browntree Solutions, Concern Burundi and Cassava Fintech. And we're really delighted that we have all of those organizations today joining us on this panel. Together um, with, with this group of people, we've used human-centered design methodologies to better understand the experiences of end users who have received mobile money enabled CBA in Burundi specifically. And today we're gonna hear from our excellent panel about how they think end user perspectives can be used to improve digital um, humanitarian cash programming and also crucially how those findings from the projects are now being implemented in Burundi. So now let's um, briefly meet the panel. So firstly I'm really delighted to introduce Theophil Bujeje who is Concern Burundi's Social Protection Program Coordinator and Teofil brings a wealth of experience with him having worked for Concern for 13 years in a number of capacities, including working across Concern's social protection projects. We're also delighted to be joined by Wood Gitobu, who is General Manager at Cassava Fintech Burundi. Wood is a business technologist with extensive experience in the telecoms industry, having worked with Celtel, Safaricom and Econet Wireless Group, where he currently works with Cassava Fintech in Burundi. And last but not least, we're joined by Louisa Seferis, who is an independent consultant uh, with 15 years of humanitarian experience, currently working with a range of both humanitarian and social protection actors mm -hmm. on topics from cash assistance to livelihoods to people-centered aid. And formally in her role at Grand Tree Solutions, Louisa led on this GSMA user journey project. We're also joined by my colleague Zoe Hamilton, uh, Insights Manager at GSMA M4H. And Zoe has extensive experience in human-centered design methods and worked on this user journey project in Burundi in 2019. So to kick us off and set the scene for us, I would like to hand over to Zoe, who is going to briefly take you, over, take you through the key findings of the report that we published, and then we'll get into the panel discussion. So over to you, Zoe. Great, thanks so much, Jenny. Um, hi, everyone. Before we head over to our amazing panel, um, I thought I'd kick us off by presenting some of the key findings of, of this report. Um, and later we'll hear from the people who worked on it um, as well to, to gain a little, a little more depth to that. So this is, this is the report that we are uh, discussing today, Mobile Money Enabled Cash Assistance User Journeys in Burundi. Um, so as Jenny said, if designed appropriately and used in an enabling context, mobile money CBA has the potential to be transformational. It can offer benefits above and beyond the cash itself. Ideally, financial and digital inclusion can lead to a multitude of additional benefits for end users. However, programs are often designed from the perspective of humanitarian organizations rather than from the end users themselves, meaning these benefits aren't always realized in practice. Additionally, in order for these benefits to be realized equitably, uh, they need to be designed from not only the perspective of end users, but some, from some of the, the most marginalized end users. This can ensure that programs are, are both fully accessible to everybody um, and that end results will be equitable. Uh, and that's why we decided to use a human-centered design approach uh, for this research to really illustrate one, how that methodology can be used in, in program design, and, and two, to gain a deeper understanding of end users' lived experiences. As Jenny mentioned, we did this research with Ground Truth Solutions, Econet Burundi, Kasava FinTech, and Concern Worldwide. Uh, our panelists are going to speak further to the specific methods we used, but I thought I would provide an overview of, of how this work was done. Um, we started with a desk review and key informant interviews to set the scene um, along with an inception workshop to align our stakeholders. And then we conducted in-depth 
qualitative interviews to really understand from the users how their experience was throughout the process of receiving cash and voucher assistance through mobile money in the region of, of Kurundo in northern Burundi. Uh, we then took these interviews and used them to run a co-creation workshop with the, the stakeholders, our, our partners in this research in, in Bujumbura, in the capital, um, and, and from there did a quantitative survey to verify that the results we were seeing uh, held true uh, among a, a larger pool of end users. Uh, from here, we created user journey maps or visualizations of these experiences using the first person so that we could really understand what were the pain points, what were the, the benefits, um, the, the things that improved users' journeys along the way. So I'm gonna just show you briefly uh, one of our personas. So this is Aja, a, a fictive persona that we created based on the real life experiences of concerns and users. Uh, while Aja is, is fictional, she represents very much the, the real demographics and, and experiences of, of users in Kurundo. Uh, so for example, Aja is a 39 year old woman. Um, she lives in a household of 11 people, including nine children. Uh, she never attended school and can't read or write, and she's never used uh, a mobile phone before, which was really important for this program. So as part of the program, Aja received a SIM card that Concern gave her, um, and she used it only on cash out days, but not for other things because she was worried it could get stolen. Um, so here we can see Aja's experience that that we visualized from eligibility when she was first approached by concern through the end of the program. The report contains five of these different journeys and at each step we identified what worked well uh, and what was a, a challenge, which helped us identify which aspects of, of the program could be improved from a user perspective. So I'll just highlight a few of these trends before I hand over to the panel. Um, we found that, that across these user journeys across different characteristics of end users, people's experiences were enhanced when they had someone by their side that they could trust. Uh, Concern has uh, community representatives called Mama Lumiaz, um, and when Mama Lumiaz were, were there and, and could help them navigate the system, that enhanced their experience. Additionally, when assistance is transparent and accessible and issues were swiftly dealt with, that improved their experience. And finally, when cash assistance was built into longer term financial support. Um, in this case, there were village, uh, village savings and loans groups in Kurundo. And when people were a part of those groups, it, it made the experience better. Now, user experiences were frustrated when users didn't own or have a mobile phone. As part of this program in particular, users were not provided with a mobile phone as part of programming, which for users was a challenge. In other concern programming, however, phones are provided. Additionally, when the process wasn't explained adequately or when they needed to shoulder additional costs to access their assistance, uh, especially those with limited mobility. So that included people who, example, who were pregnant um, or people with disabilities who might need to hire a taxi in order to access the cash out location. Uh, additionally, when users weren't encouraged to use the SIM card, uh, they were told to, to keep it aside and, and keep it safe. They couldn't access the, the potential benefits that that SIM card could have provided them. And finally, when there was a long wait time between initial targeting and receiving the cash assistance. So those are some of our uh, findings. Um, and I'll now hand back over to the panel to, to take you through um, some additional, additional aspects of that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Zoe, for giving us a whistle-stop tour. Um, I think that's really helped to, to set some of the themes up that we're going to dig into, and we can post that report link into the chat for those of you who are interested in reading more. But for now, I want to turn to our excellent panel. And first, I would love to ask Teofil to help situate us in the Burundian context. So Tiafil, you've worked with Concern in Burundi for over 13 years now. 
Can you tell us a bit more about what the humanitarian need is in Burundi and how Concern Burundi has been responding to that need, especially with cash programming over the years? Over to you, Tiafil. Hi, everyone. Um, Burundi is a landlocked country in the Great Lakes region of Eastern Africa, bordered with Rwanda uh, to the north, Tanzania to the east and south, and DRC to the west. Uh, Burundi is a small country. Um, since 1993, Burundi uh, underwent various crises, uh, which have led to huge humanitarian needs. Uh, to start with, uh, since 1993, Burundi uh, underwent a fight between government uh, and the robbers movement uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, and this movement, uh, this robber movement was born after the assassination of elected, elected president. Uh, later on in 2015, another crisis arose due to the president's uh, extension of his term for the third time. Uh, this led to massive displacement around the country and into uh, and um, uh, outside the countries where half a million people went abroad. So today, Burundi faces many many shocks uh, due to natural natural disasters and climate change, namely drought, um, um, heavy rains. Uh, they destroy co crops and cause internal displacement displacement as well. We can also mention now uh, the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 to Burundian citizens, uh, also the increase of returnees from neighboring countries, weak infrastructures, low, low resilience among uh, populations, uh, etc. In terms of humanitarian needs in Burundi, Burundi, of course, is a country which is extremely poor, uh, most of the time uh, ranked among the top last uh, by human development index. Like for example, in uh, 2019, Burundi was ranked 185 out of 189 uh, countries. Uh, uh, so um, the food security is an issue in Burundi uh, and uh, uh, is among humanitarian needs in Burundi. Uh, malnutrition, uh, we have chronic malnutrition rate, which is around 52%. Uh, and also we have acute malnutrition, acute malnutrition, which is around six six percent. These are data from 2020. In terms of protection, uh, protection issues also remain significant. Uh, among them, uh, housing, land and property, women and ch and the children are particularly vulnerable to the pro protection risks which include gender-based violence and human trafficking as well. Uh, if you look at the HRP 2021, 2.3 million people are in need of assistance in Burundi, and among them, 700,000 uh, with acute needs, uh, according to OCHA, uh, AP 2021. And if you look at uh, the trend, humanitarian uh, needs increased from 25% if you compare 2021 to 2020. And the recent uh, International Monetary Fund uh, report classes Burundi uh, the top last out of 193 world countries with the lowest gross domestic product per capita of 267 US dollar only. Uh, Let's look at uh, concern response. Concern Burundi has been operation. Concern has been operational in Burundi since 1997. Of course, it was uh, during the war, with emergency response. And currently, we are implementing projects in four of the country's eight provinces: Chibitoke, which is um, uh, north uh, west, Kirundo in the north, Bubanza and rural Bujumbura, which are around the Bujumbura, the capital. Uh, concern response focuses on three sectors. One is health and nutrition, uh, social protection, including graduation model. The graduation model is uh, the project which started cash transfer in Burundi. Uh, and food security. As I mentioned, cash transfer is key uh, approach of concern Burundi 
and has implemented in different projects aiming to support consumption needs for the most vulnerable and those affected by the shocks. Uh, cash transfer also facilitates the startup of income generating activities because also do some more trainings on business and facilitate access to credit to increase resilience and nutrition. Uh, the main donors for concern are uh, namely Irish Aid, European U Union, GIZ, World Food Program, UNICEF, UNOPS, and uh, other private donations as well. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Tiafil, and for, for outlining and, and situating us in, in Burundi. Clearly, there's a huge humanitarian need, and it sounds like Concern has been doing some really amazing work to respond to that need. I'd be very interested to hear from Wood, um, who is from Kasava Fintech, to, to hear a bit, a, more, a bit more about how the private sector and mobile operators more specifically have been leveraging digital services to also respond to some of these humanitarian needs. So Wood, could you speak a little bit to um, the fact that Cassava Fintech has been increasingly working with humanitarian actors like Concern in Burundi and what your experience has been of partnering with such organizations and how this has been evolving over time? Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, good. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so just to respond to you, uh, is that Cassava Fintech Burundi uh, has been playing within the humanitarian space uh, for the last four or five years. Uh, and of course, Concern uh, was one of the first, I would say, pioneer projects or partners that we had uh, coming on board in terms of uh, you know, CVA program. So uh, after the experience with concern, uh, I think a number or rather a number of other uh, humanitarian players within or actors within Burundi, uh, you know, they are now coming in to, you know, embrace the, uh, the technology uh, in terms of uh, pushing humanitarian agenda. Uh, so to date we have over 15, uh, you know, key humanitarian players within Burundi uh, pushing disbursement or cash transfers, uh, both conditional and conditional uh, through our platform, that is Echo Cash, uh, which is our mobile money brand. Uh, but of course, uh, outside that, uh, just to take uh, one step back, uh, is that initially when we came in as a business in Burundi, uh, of course, uh, cash disbursements uh, was not one of our key uh, strategic thrusts that we had for this particular market. Uh, but of course, after scoping and I mean, uh, doing a uh, scoping of the market as it were, and of course, looking at the factors that have just been explained by my, you know, predecessor, my fellow uh, friend, Theophil, uh, is that we found there was a need uh, within the market for us to be able uh, to optimize digital services, uh, to be able to deliver efficiencies around that area of humanitarian. And that is when now we actually uh, put our heads together to now uh, put up a platform that is able to you know, assist in terms of pushing aid or cash aid uh, to beneficiaries across the projects that were in existence. So uh, like I've said, uh, initially there was a lot of, you know, um, uh, you know wait and see approach, I would say, uh, in that no one was so sure that this thing can actually work. Uh, no one could be able truly really to uh, sort of like put your finger and say what we were selling as a solution was actually something that we were able to execute with the efficiencies that we were actually selling at the time. But over time, again, we've been able to buy the much needed trust, uh, you know, uh, and what that has meant is that now more and more um, humanitarian actors within Burundi are actually coming in uh, where we were actually the ones, you know, pushing the agenda to them. We are actually finding them knocking at our door, uh, you know, requesting for us to, you know, come up with, you know, uh, partnerships for us to be able to deliver on their projects. Uh, how do I like, look at it in terms of our, our 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 positioning as a business? So two ways of looking at it. First of all, there is the commercial aspect, uh, 
But of course, beyond the commercial aspect, there's what drives us, I mean, that which drives us as a business in terms of our value. And of course, the mission that we have as a business, the purpose that we have as a business. So the, the area of creating impact within the communities that we operate. In fact, we say that we envision a socially, you know, uh, and financially inclusive future that leaves no African beyond, uh, behind as a, as a company. Our mission, again, also uh, speaks of, you know, improving the overall quality of life by offering access to digital and social services that are techn technologically driven. So those are quite embedded within our, uh, our core mission and vision as a company. Then coming to position that within the humanitarian or the situation within Burundi becomes much easier because beyond the uh, commercial motivation or incentive, then we also have the softer path that really drives uh, or rather speaks to our impact in terms of what we are doing to transform the communities that we are in. So uh, in a nutshell, I would say, um, not only concern international, but now we have key uh, humanitarian players. Uh, most recently, uh, we have UN bodies now coming, or rather UN agencies coming in. Uh, we already have projects running under UNHCR. We have engagements with UNDP. We have engagements with the uh, IOM. We have uh, uh, a contract ready to sign with World Food Program. All these now borrowing from the successes that we've seen coming from these first uh, projects that we ran with concern. Very, again, interesting was how this particular project was run because it again acts as a key benchmark for the new players that are coming on board. Um, you know, starting from uh, the fact that it was the first of a project that we were able to actually have a forum whereby we were able to collect feedback, uh, not only as the operator, but you know, it was a tripartite kind of a feedback session that we had. And we had to keep our, I mean, we had to borrow a lot of insights from that, which again have helped us over time to be able to, you know, optimize and improve some of our, you know, uh, our processes to ensure that as we move by, we continue to better our services at the end of the day. So I think in a nutshell, that is what it is uh, in Burundi. And I think we should be able to, you know, uh, to dis dissect further and, you know, be able to bring out more information and more insights as we continue this discussion. Thanks, Jenny, back to you. Thanks very much, Wood. It, it certainly sounds like you have your hands full with, as you mentioned, over 15 humanitarian organizations now in the country using EcoCash. Um, so I don't envy you with the, with the huge amount of work that that must mean. I noticed you also mentioned trust, which has been at the center of strengthening the relationships and heightening the demand. And on the topic of uh, relationships, I, I think um, it would be really good to go back to understanding a bit more about this partnership and this relationship between Concern and Cassava Fintech um, that we initially identified in 2019 as a potential user donor project for, for this research. Um, and so Louisa, you, you might remember, I think towards the end of 2019, we approached you in your former role at Ground Tree Solutions to see if you were uh, willing to, to work with GSMA to conduct user journeys to better understand experiences and needs and preferences of end users in Burundi. I wonder if you can share a bit more, maybe firstly about Ground Tree Solutions user journey methodology at large, and then walk us through a little bit more the key steps that you undertook in Burundi. So drawing on um, what Zoe had presented a little bit earlier. Yeah, thanks and thanks for having me. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Ground Tree Solutions is a, is a non-governmental organization based out of Vienna that supports humanitarian um, actors to, to look at uh, aid recipients' perspective on the assistance they receive and to amplify their voices, um, both at the local and the, and the international levels. 
So, I mean, as many of you are probably aware of, and I see we have a lot of different participants um, from around the world, and that's great. User journeys are just one tool um, that can be used in human-centered approaches. Um, and they're generally kind of a bit more labor intensive, but really offer those, those deeper insights. And they can be used at the beginning of a program to kind of design and, and, and launch that, that program, or as was the case here, to evaluate and iterate the learning to better understand recipients' experiences. And that looks a little bit different than, uh, for example, user-centered design that might be developing a specific product. And what's great about this, and particularly bringing together a humanitarian actor like, like uh, Concern um, with the uh, Cassava FinTech is that it flips the mindset, right? And so the methodology might look fairly standard from, from what has been presented, but I think the fantastic insights come from these iterative processes. And that's something that ground truth, whether we're looking at the, the quantitative perception surveys that are done um, throughout humanitarian responses in the, um, in, uh, well, across the globe, and more mixed methods approaches, which is what was used in this case, um, is really how you get those, those workshops and those discussions. I saw that Malik had a question around what goes into an inception and co-creation workshop. Obviously, we don't have time to go into all the details, but I think the important thing to note in this methodology is that there's always this sense check and this, this co-creation aspect of validating not only the objectives and what the audiences offer this research, but to define the target groups and how we think they might experience the program. And why that's important is because human-centered design doesn't actually mean ignoring our perspectives as humanitarians or as mobile network operators. It's actually recognizing that we might have inherent perceptions or biases um, in how we approach program design and how we design products, particularly when we're talking about vulnerable uh, segments of the population. You know, Burundi has really flourishing as, as Wood and Theophil were talking about mobile money um, landscape. In Kirundo in particular, and with the communities where um, concern works, that may or may not be the case. And that's really about exploring then how people experience this program. Um, and I think the last kind of key element here in this particular process that, that is really central to how Ground Truth approaches user journeys um, is the mixed methods. So being able to dive into these intimate conversations with recipients, um, which are very qualitative, very exploratory, borrowing on you know, ethnographic and, and, and other techniques um, to really uh, gain that insight into people's experiences. Um, but at the same time, being able to quantify or validate those findings via the survey, um, which has a representative sample is a really powerful tool. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you for, for that overview. And I'm particularly interested to hear from your experience whether there was anything particularly unique about undertaking the user journey approach in Karundo in Burundi compared with the other settings that you've worked in with uh, Ground Truth Solutions human centered design approaches. Was there any way that you had to kind of adapt the methodology? And, and how did the findings either complement or differ from the other settings in which you previously worked? I mean, it's a great question. And I think, you know, we all grappled. And this is why, personally, I, I'm a huge fan of human-centered design techniques, just because um, it's really about opening up these processes and discussing them collaboratively. So previously, um, and those of you who have probably seen on, on the Ground Truth uh, website, is that we were looking at uh, the kind of personas or differences in experiences between payment systems. So in Kenya, it was comparing the experience of someone receiving mobile money with an ATM card or an electronic voucher to purchase food. Um, in Iraq, it was something similar as well. Um, and here we were really looking at different personas within one program. And that changed the perspective in terms of looking at what are the characteristics that influence people's experiences. And so, as I mentioned in the inception workshop, we talk, we unpacked that from the Cassava FinTech perspective, how they saw this particular subset of clients um, experiencing the products and how concern um, saw uh, the recipient groups uh, engaging with uh, the program. I think it's important to mention here that um, recipients were receiving a SIM card um, through which they would get cash out. Um, and that was not connected to a specific device as was the graduation program that Theophil mentioned where people were receiving a phone. And that's a very, very important finding here. Um, and also important to underline that the program we looked at was a six month humanitarian program that was really aimed at alleviating the economic burden that families and in particular women face um, when children show symptoms of malnutrition, which those of you, I see a lot of people joining from Burundi um, know uh, better than, than everyone else around the, the kind of the, the contextual factors that, that um, contribute to malnutrition. And so 
what was unique in this is that we had a fairly homogenous group of mainly women, and that's where the personas really reflect and um, was predominantly women. Um, there were low lateral, uh, levels of reading and writing and of digital literacy in this area. And so it made it a harder context to talk about mobile money. Um, you'll see in Zoe's presentation in the report, we used cards and pictograms to talk about the different functions that a SIM card could have. And by and large, most people were not familiar with them. Um, and so what that made us as ground truth have to challenge is that um, it's not just about thinking of, of vulnerabilities in a humanitarian sense or thinking of clients as, as kind of different user groups, but really stepping into people's shoes and understanding that different profiles and capacities may actually look like similar journeys if people's priorities and barriers are similar. So if I say to a humanitarian, you know, that that essentially when we spoke to, you know, older men who, who had mobility issues, that they face similar barriers to, to women who were caring for a large number of children because both could not read and write and had to travel um, to receive the cash, they might be really insulted that I'm saying that the vulnerability looks the same. No, that's not what we're saying. We're looking now from their perspective in terms of accessing the cash, accessing digital platforms and networks and having a functional literacy um, that's really important. And so sometimes when we're so focused on this targeting the most vulnerable as humanitarians, we forget to consider how people are supported by community structures and how they contribute to those structures because that's really what strengthens digital literacy and um, even if it's not the objective of the program and so what's really great about shifting that mindset and looking at the different characteristics within that program which is part of the co-creation process is to say okay we talked to all these different people we saw that this is how they experienced the program what are those key profiles what are those key characteristics that make the journeys different um, it then allows us to look at how people navigate those community structures and it's much more empowering and and it enables us to dig into those experiences. And the Maman Lumière or the light mothers that were mentioned, you know, Concern developed those for a completely different purpose to support women who were, who were dealing with very difficult situations and, and caring for malnourished children. Those women turned out to be the best asset um, in terms of navigating the how to receive um, cash via mobile money. Um, and in the future, they could be one of the best assets for the, the other programs, whether it's graduation or Medica Bandi and the social protection system. Um, because they're stepping into these roles in terms of facilitation. And so when this popped up during the interviews and we were starting to see that, the, that in particular women were relying on the Maman Lumière, the survey then allowed us to dig in and see that, yes, 79, almost 80% of the women were saying, absolutely, Maman Lumière have my best interest in mind, and therefore they are a really important part of uh, my experience. And that means that then not only Concern, but other um, humanitarian actors and, and Kazava Fintech can look at the Maman Lumière in a new light when we're talking about enabling access of certain populations to these digital platforms. Wonderful, thanks. Thanks, Louisa. I think you touched on a lot of fascinating points there. and. One of the things that really resonated, I think, with, with us in the experience was the really central role of these community structures that you've mentioned, especially the, the potential for the Mama Lumière to actually support the programme even more than, than they had been doing so in the past. And I'm interested um, from, from Teofil to hear from your perspective, because you're working with these cash recipients on a daily basis. And so from the findings that, that Zoe presented at the beginning and also um, drawing on, on Louise's insights just now, were there any particularly surprising findings that, that came from the project and the overall experience for you? Um, and then a, a secondary question for you is, is whether you at Concern have made any changes to your cash programming as a result of the work that was done? Thank you, Jenny. As I mentioned earlier, we started the graduation project in 2012 in Burundi, and um, uh, the findings are not so surprising, but some findings need particular attention on our side. Uh, for example, um, uh, hearing that not having a mobile phone, a phone is uh, a case of frustration to users, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we provide, we provide uh, mobile phones like in a graduation project since the beginning, but in the other projects, of course, we don't provide uh, mobile phones, and this, this depends upon the budget. Uh, so, um, you know, the issue of a SIM card, SIM card face is small, a small item, and keeping a SIM card must keep it safe and uh, correctly. 
So uh, keeping a SIM card without mobile money, mobile phone, sorry, it's, uh, it's, it's not very easy. Uh, uh, and what we do, we sensitize beneficiaries that the SIM card is their mobile account that is used to, 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 uh, to withdraw cash when they uh, during cash at times. time. Uh, so, um, so we try to improve this uh, and ensure access to mobile phones for all recipients uh, in, uh, in our programs. Of course, it's not very easy because this depends upon the project, but well, the idea is to uh, avail mobile phones to all beneficiaries for all cash transfers. But this, as I said, uh, it's never uh, done 100%. Um, another finding that we, what, which needs particular attention is uh, from the beneficiaries, they said that uh, waiting between targeting and uh, cash transfer long time is frustrating. Of course, this makes sense because we create expectation. When you say, okay, you are a beneficiary, you will get cash. Uh, when you explain the process and you wait for a long time, these, of course, uh, make beneficiary lose their expectations uh, or say they, 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 are, they are trust, for example. So uh, we try to reduce time now between targeting and first cash transfer, because uh, as you know, uh, cash transfer, there are other activities which are done before you organize cash transfers. We have to uh, negotiate a SIM card to the mobile network provider, they, are, they have to be registered. They have to create uh, an account, uh, EcoCash account, for example, in this case, for example. And uh, you have to make sure that all is correctly done. And especially with the uh, regulations now, uh, no SIM card in Burundi can be activated without proper registration. And this require uh, that beneficiary uh, have all his or her identification uh, photographs and photographs of also the ID card to uh, for them to activate the the SIM card. So uh, what we do then, we also sensitize uh, beneficiaries on uh, how it works because it's very important. It's very important because um, if they don't know or the process, we have some cases like for example when we started in 2013 during the targeting, uh, it was in Chibitoka, I remember I was still working there. Beneficiaries, five beneficiaries out of 1,000 refused the aid saying that we cannot accept, even we are poor, we cannot accept money coming from the mobile phone. They said it's from the devil. It's not, it's not <laughs> unbelievable, un unbelievable. So then they, they <laughs> would be laughing. <laughs> So they, they refused to try to convince them, but they said, no, 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 no. We, 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 yes. we prefer to remain poor rather than yes. accepting money from uh, coming from the air, from the, 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 the mobile funds. Uh, of course, what we do also is to teach uh, beneficiaries what is the other use of mobile, mo mobile funds or SIM card beyond receiving cash transfer because uh, Mobile phones are used for communication. They can also communicate with their friends, their relatives. They are. Um, they they can also use uh, to get uh, cash or send cash later. And also, uh, once an account is created, beneficiaries can keep using uh, the 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 account created for the transactions they need. Um, I would like to come back to Louisa's point on what was unique on literacy. Uh, uh, of course, the level of literacy is very important in uh, using mobile money because, uh, you know, uh, the account must be protected and uh, each uh, EcoCash account must have his uh, PIN code and the PIN code is made of, made of four digits. Four digits, and imagine someone who does not know reading or writing how to memorize and use the four digits as um, as pin, co co uh, pin code. So when we started, we had saw a big number of 
uh, beneficiaries who were illiterate in 2012. So what we did was to use a pin code, a different pin code that was for zeros for all. But uh, it was dangerous, of course, because um, you know if they have similar pin code, it's easy that someone, if someone gets um, the mobile phone or the SIM card of his uh, or her neighbor, it's easy to uh, access to the account and start and, and make transactions. This happened, of course. We have a case in Kirundo where um, a beneficiary uh, was waiting for a monthly transfer. And then, but in uh, that time, there was a need for his son studying uh, in another province to, to get money because he was sick. So the beneficiary was aware that he can use his mobile phone to transfer cash to uh, someone. So the son indicated him um, a, a number, a phone, mobile phone, to which he can send uh, the, the cash. So before our monthly transfer, the beneficiary went to the post. By that time, we used post office for, uh, to, to withdraw cash. But now we have changed uh, after discussion with uh, Econet Wireless. They have what they call SAPA, SAPA agent and the agent who go to meet beneficiaries for their transaction. So it was done at the post and the, the beneficiary to the post with uh, 10,000 Burundi francs, asked the post agent, uh, please, I heard that it's possible to send this money using this mobile phone to my son who is in another province. Said, okay, it can help you. So once the, um, the post agent accesses, accesses to his, uh, his uh, account because the pin code was default, was for zeros, and uh, it was known by uh, post agent, agents, so the post agent found that the beneficiary has a balance of 24,500 francs. He said, wow, how come? That man does not know that he has money in his account. Maybe he forgot this money. So before doing the, the required operation, the agent transferred the money from the beneficiary to his own account. Two days later, when they invited to go to cash withdrawal, the, there was, of course, the account was empty. So we discussed with um, a connect agent. They showed us, show us, uh, they showed us a list of transactions. And we came to know that the transaction was done two days before by the same agent to his own number, of course, which is bizarre, of course. So this is to mention, uh, of course, that the level of literacy is very important mm -hmm. and an impact on um, uh, cash transfer transaction. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Teofil. So yes, lots of challenges that I think many of us are familiar with that interestingly, I think span across many different contexts. Um, and I think many of those challenges as well were very much validated by the end users through, through this research that we did. Um, I would be interested to hear Wood's reactions to, to some of um, those, those challenges. And um, at the same time, would also like to ask Wood a little bit more about this co-creation workshop, because as Louisa said, um, we have a question from the audience about that co-creation uh, workshop. Um, so could you explain a bit more, Wood, about what happened in the validation workshop? Um, and how, how you found the experience? Did, did you think that it kind of highlighted anything new to you that you hadn't previously considered? So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Zoe. Uh, so I'll respond to your last, uh, your last question uh, in terms of how the conference was like. And uh, I'll say it was, uh, it was not really a one day affair, uh, but of course, uh, a number of activities that ran before culminated into that particular session that we had. Uh, but of course, uh, that was the climax of it in that uh, we were able as an operator specifically for the first time to be able to get feedback and insights 
uh, as regards our own operations in terms of what we offered as a platform. Uh, the experiences from the users or the beneficiaries themselves who are very critical in all this. And of course, also experience from our partner. So um, key for me was that unlike other projects that we had run before, uh, we had never had that opportunity uh, to really uh, sort of get candid feedback uh, and particularly feedback that was coming uh, almost verbatim from the beneficiaries themselves. You know, uh, so we're able to get both positive and negative uh, feedback. Uh, and of course, based on, on that, we've been able to take a number of initiatives. Um, key of what I'll say is uh, over time, uh, we've come to realize in terms of, uh, you know, the basics of, uh, you know, uh, executing uh, uh, digital payments via mobile. Uh, I think uh, the effectiveness of our delivery uh, uh, mechanism really uh, is has been you know over time been determined by our our our, our smart customization. Uh, what do I mean by smart customization? It's that now we've come to realize that each of our partners comes with a different set of needs. So we have the platform, yes, but of course when you go to the nitty gritty of it, the expectations and the you know uh, the profiles of the beneficiaries. Uh, differ from one setup to the other. So it is very important and very critical that we are scalable in terms of our processes, that we are able to, you know, quickly uh, be very flexible to be able to deliver within the short times that are, you know, that would largely characterize uh, humanitarian uh, activities around Burundi. Um, then coming to what Theophil has just explained, uh, very interesting again, uh, Burundi, I think, as a, as a country, really uh, is very unique in itself, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, where it, it lies on a number of uh, aspects if you benchmark against the other countries in the region, uh, from economics point of view, uh, literacy point of view, you know, uh, lagging quite behind, uh, looking at, you know, mobile penetration uh, as a 2020 report. Uh, I think it was running at about 51% mobile penetration against uh, the peers, for example, Rwanda, Kenya, which are in the upwards of 80%, 90%. Uh, if you look at smart, I mean, uh, data uh, or smartphone uh, penetration is about uh, 7%. Uh, so if you look at it from that angle and considering that we are players within the digital space, then of course that becomes really uh, uh, almost like a showstopper. But of course, we've been not, we've not, we've really worked to ensure that that does not really impede or stop us from uh, driving the agenda of uh, financial inclusion. So instead, what we've done is that we look for ways and means to be able to work around those challenges. Um, you've spoken about, uh, you know, uh, no low knowledge in terms of how to operate uh, devices uh, in some of the populations, especially the ones uh, that were targeted by this project with their concern because there were women uh, uh, and some of them were really elderly and not really educated. So uh, one of the things that we've done over time because the concerns that have come to us uh, border on uh, the agent's code of code conduct uh, and of course, even the data privacy uh, of the beneficiaries. Those are very critical areas of concern, both for the project owners and of course, uh, the beneficiaries themselves. So as an operation in Burundi, I think we've uh, actually come up with, uh, we are already working on two um, uh, policy papers or uh, kind of guidance that is gonna uh, govern how we transact business or around the humanitarian space. And once this is out, I think it should be like the first, if not globally, uh, I think within Africa and the region, whereby we are coming up with an agent code of conduct uh, under humanitarian. And secondly, we're also coming up with data protection policy under humanitarian. And we're working very closely again with GSMA on that. Uh, they, so uh, I think that's coming out as a key, you know, key selling point for our services and for the platform especially for the bigger players who are now coming on board to be able to embark on a, you know, CVA program to their projects. Um, then again, if you look at it, uh, there's also big challenges in terms of uh, 
uh, agent network because of course uh, we require agent network to be able to dispense the monies. Uh, and if you look at the setup of this project, it was actually in one of the poorest provinces in Burundi. Uh, so even the incentive or the motivation for independent agents to go and open businesses, this location was never there. So what we had to do is that we had to really, uh, we, are, we, are, we really had to very quickly mobilize and set up a mobile agent team that was able to attend to the need uh, at very short notice. Uh, but again, very important is that we we're also able to leverage now the community structures that she talked about. In that now, currently as we speak, uh, we do no, no longer need to, for any other projects, even outside uh, concern, we do not need to uh, carry these agents to the location, but rather, we've developed agents within the structures. The structures they have, the community leaders they have, are the same people that over time we've developed to be agents that represent us in those locations. So that has been able to uh, not only create, uh, you know, economic vibrancy within those communities, but also extend our services where it was, uh, you know, very difficult before uh, to reach out in terms of our provision for services. Uh, so I think, uh, Jenny, uh, that is would be that would be my response. Uh, uh, I hope I've been able to respond adequately to what has been asked. Back to you. Indeed, and I think in that you've also managed to respond to a number of questions that are coming through in the Q&A, which was very clever, either you saw them or uh, it was just a, a happy um, a result. But so one of the questions was about how you're ensuring that digital financial services are remaining accessible for poor people after the support from NGOs. And you spoke a lot about mobilization and setting up mobile agent teams and so on. So. I think you've done a wonderful job of answering those. The time has really run away with us today. Um, and so I think we are going to have to call it a day, but I'm um, sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. Um, we would love to connect. Um, I see a few people typing in the chat, um, their LinkedIn's and things like that. So really, really happy to connect and to, to direct you to each of the panelists. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. And as I said, please do reach out with, with any further questions. But on that note, um, I wanted to say a huge thank you to our excellent panelists. It was wonderful how we could have one of you from each organization um, speaking from, from very different standpoints, but really kind of really showcasing the importance of coming together to work as a team for the benefit of the end users ultimately. And on that note, um, I will hand back to Sarah. Thank you everyone once again. Thank you so much, Jenny, and also to Louisa, Teofile, Wood and Zoe. It's been a really interesting webinar. And I think Jenny, you summed it up quite nicely there, which is sort of one of the things that I'm kind of leaving this webinar um, with is actually if you get the right people coming to try and work together so you've got you know the experts in, in trying to understand how to do a really good kind of study you know mixing those you know in-depth interviews to really unpick the detail in people's lives through to actually you know sort of validating the results through the quantitative and then you work with a development sector who knows the market really well. And, and I mean, this idea of using community leaders as trainers and potential new agents, I mean, you know, that's, that's a fantastic insight. And then coupled with working with someone who is as open to getting feedback from both the humanitarian and the end user as, as Wood and his team are, um, I think that makes you know, a wonderful collaboration that actually, you know, is beneficial to all, it, you know, it meets, the, it helps concern meet their aims. It helps, um, you know, uh, EcoCash meet their aims as well in terms of both their mission, um, sorry, vision and mission. And it also reaches that end user um, who now hopefully begins to be more financially included and also hopefully has their financial overall financial health improved and new opportunities opened as well. So it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I really encourage anyone on the call to, to dive deep into that report. We are also going to share the recording, the link to the report, and all one's LinkedIn profiles in an email with everybody who signed up, and that will come out either tomorrow or the day after. 
So we will make sure that you can all connect and stay in touch and continue this really important discussion. Um, thank you so much uh, panelists and to attendees for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you all in a webinar again soon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.